We are here at the Peabody Public Library in Columbia City on November 8th, 2007. We are interviewing Jean Beyer, who was born June 18th, 1920, and he lives in Columbia City. He served during World War II in the Navy, and his highest rank was Lieutenant Senior Grade. Uh, Jean, thank you for for being here today. We really appreciate that. Uh, first off, um, when you first, tell me a little bit about Columbia City before you went into the service. Were you guys even thinking about a war? No, except, except I knew the war was going over in Europe and I figured when things were going bad for France there in England that eventually we would be involved. Were, were but you, I didn't think much about it. I was a student at Purdue University. Okay. And were you married at that time? No. No, you weren't married. Why did you join the service? Were you drafted or volunteered or how did that come about? Well, I was drafted. I was uh, enlisted in the draft. I got my draft card here. And then I guess they had a drawing at Washington and got your numbers in order to which you'd be drafted. And I got a card from my draft board saying that uh, my number is 2704, and I was the very last one on the registry at, uh, on the Purdue campus. So I didn't have any chance of being drafted. So you volunteered then? So then, uh, after I heard about uh, the war, of course, I got the news on a Sunday, and I was home, and my roommate and I turned on the radio and heard the news. Uh, I just mauled it over. Uh, what to do, and I went home at Christmas vacation, and uh, I told my folks I'd like to enlist as a naval pilot. And my mother didn't want me to do that. She says, that's too dangerous. So just as I left, my dad took me aside and says, if you want to be a naval, try to be a naval pilot, go ahead. So my mother decided that uh, when I went to Purdue, you had to take ROTC, two years. And then you could take another two years and become an officer in the Army. I didn't want to be in the Army, so I quit after two years. And my mother, when she was about four years old, decided that what branch of service I should be in. Here's a picture of me with my sister in my naval uniform. Uh, I went down to Indianapolis and uh, I got through most of my physical, except I had trouble with the eyes. And the, the recruiter told me, he says, the doctor will be here a week from today, you come back again, and I want to go, we'll go over your eye test again and see what he says. Well, I went back a week later and uh, I couldn't pass the depth perception test, and he says, uh, you have no business trying to land an aircraft, airplane on an aircraft carrier with your eyes. So he wouldn't, uh, so I couldn't become a naval pilot. So then the Navy had a program called B-7. They would let you graduate from college. Then you took a 90-day course and they commissioned you an ensign. They're called 90-day wonders because after you took the course, they wondered what they had. So. Uh, I enlisted January 17th for four years in the Naval Reserve. And uh, right after I graduated, I got a letter from the Navy saying that I'd been tentatively assigned to report uh, January 4th, 43 at Notre Dame campus. On uh, December, I got a letter saying my orders had been changed. I was to report to uh, downtown Northwestern University in Chicago. Along with that letter was a railroad ticket to get on at Albion, Indiana and take the train. And there's where I reported December 31st, New Year's Eve. The wind was blowing off of the Lake Michigan. It was about five below zero. Well, then, uh, here's a picture of me and my apprentice seaman. So I'm in my real naval uniform now. And this is a room that I stayed in. There were 1,800 Navy men there downtown Northwestern at this time. 
After was there about a week, there was a special notice that uh, the Naval Supply Corps was looking for officers, potential officers, to uh, take a special course at Harvard University. It uh, lasted a year. They, they had taken a two-year Master of Business Administration course, reduced it to eight months. They had taken a, naval, a year Naval Supply and Finance course and reduced it to uh, four months. And I thought, gee, this would be wonderful to try to get an education at the Navy's expense. So I made an application. After going through two screening boards on uh, January 22nd, I was promoted to midship and was put on the train to Boston. This is a picture, I don't really make it out very good, of the Harvard Business School at uh, Boston, Massachusetts. This is Chase Hall, where I stayed. And here I am studying, trying to. But I had a, I didn't want to get kicked out of the school. We had a lot of competition. Most of the people that were there were, had already graduated from business college. Uh, a lot of them were lawyers, accountants, so I studied real hard to be sure not to get kicked out. Gene, what kind of things were you studying during this program? What well, they were all uh, business courses. I got a, what was called an IA degree, which was a uh, Harvard gave called an industrial administrator. In the Navy, I studied just everything, all the rules and regulations. It was just about like going to graduate school, really. And. Uh, we took tests and compared them to the year before graduate class, and we averaged about 10% higher than the regular students had. So you can see that I was lucky to be in such a, such a group. I met uh, two interesting people there I should talk about a little bit, I think, at uh, Harvard. Uh, in April, I sprained my knee playing so batting at softball. I sent the Chelsea, Chelsea Naval Hospital and I roomed with a young Marine, good-looking guy, and in the room his bed was just surrounded by all kinds of flowers. There were beautiful women coming in there visiting, there were women out in the hallway coming out in the sea. And my roommate was Ted Williams, who was the uh, famous Boston Red Sox hitter. Uh, he was a very congenial guy. Back in those days, they didn't have TVs in your hospital room. He and I played a lot of checkers together. The other notable person I saw there was uh, Winston Churchill. He came over to uh, Harvard to give a talk uh, uh, to the armed services around Boston. There were a lot of us in the Harvard uh, yard there under the trees, and he talked to us. and. Uh, he wasn't much to look at, but he sure was inspiration. He sure felt that he was the right guy to be leading England at that time. Gee, was Ted Williams in the service when you when he yeah, was in the Yeah, Ted Williams was. Uh, uh, he was. He, he was a. I don't know whether they made him a marine pilot or not, but uh, they they took him to be a teacher for the most part. So I don't know whether he actually saw his service or not. And talk about Ted Williams, I didn't even know who he was. I didn't follow professional baseball, and I didn't, I was so dumb, I didn't even know who Ted Williams was. And I told some people I knew in Boston that, they said, well, boy, I'd sure like to meet Ted Williams. Of course, he and I played a lot of checkers together. Then on uh, June the 1st, I was promoted to an uh, engine. You had graduated by then? No. No. Okay. No. No, this is a year course. A year course, okay. So I really had it made in Boston. Engines were in great demand. And they had a, some, uh, like a USO you go to, there were, uh, you got tickets to concerts, to shows, parties, dances, and there were uh, always families that wanted to have uh, us in their homes for Sunday dinner. So I participated in all those things. In uh, January, just before graduation, 
they gave us a choice of uh, saying what kind of assignments we wanted. Well, of course, I kind of wanted to get in the war, and I signed up to be a uh, supply officer and dispersing officer on a destroyer. Uh, I graduated and I went home for a month, for a week's leave. And then in February, here I am on the west side of the Central Park in New York City. I uh, got a $7 per diem. I was to report to the supervisor of shipbuilding on Manhattan Island. I stayed with a Jewish family that lived uh, right next to this uh, street here, in a, rented a room from them. Uh, they were wonderful people. Every Sunday they insisted I eat breakfast with them, with their family, and you never eat like the Jewish people. <laughs> I like they ate anyhow. Uh, I was assigned to the USS Blue, a destroyer that was, built on, was being built on Staten Island. It was just about built. I went there on the Staten Island Ferry and helped uh, get things together to uh, get the ship ready to go. Uh, they launched the ship. Uh, we, uh, I rode in it over to Brooklyn Navy Yard. We have our armor and put on our guns. And on March the 20th, this is a picture of us uh, uh, officers on the day we were commissioned. I'm about the second guy in here. When we were there, uh, my folks came on a train. They were farmers near Wolf Lake to visit our ship. The assistant uh, engineering officer took my dad all over the ship, crawled all over it, and looked at all the guns and mechanisms, and he said he'd never seen such a conglomeration of machinery in all his life. My mother was amazed how good us officers had it. I didn't have to make my bed. I ate off of a tablecloth, had a cloth napkin during the whole war when I was on the ship, except uh, during ba when we were in battles or uh, in typhoons. When we got all our armor on everything, this is a picture of how the ship looked. We went on our shakedown cruise to uh, Bermuda, to Bermuda. About half of the uh, men we had aboard ship uh, had never been on a destroyer before, and practically all of them got seasick. I had four, five storekeepers that were sick, they couldn't work for two days. But after about eight or nine days, practically all of them adjusted to the pitch and roll of the destroyer and got over their seasickness. You didn't have any problems? Oh, no, I never got seasick. I was lucky. I was aboard deck, my office was on the main deck, and I, when you got in close, like the fellows were in the fire rooms or the engine rooms or in the radio shack, they were closed in. And I think being out in the open helped me, but I, I never got seasick. The rougher the sea, the better I liked it, as long as I knew I was going to get through it. Then uh, we got orders to uh, go with the first aircraft carrier the Navy had called the Ranger. It was obsolete, but for some reason they were taking it through the Panama Canal and going over to San Diego. We went with it. We went to, through the Panama Canal, San Diego, picked up 53 passengers and on the way to Pearl Harbor. Now this ship that I was on was the first heavy duty destroyer, a new class of destroyers. Um, get things out. We had all kinds of uh, special gear and other destroyers. This is just a picture, I can't maybe make much out of it. We had real good radar gear, we had electronic treatment, we had two inch, uh, two barrels on our five inch guns with other destroyers only had one. And uh, we had twice the anti-aircraft power that the other destroyers had. And when we got to Pearl Harbor, all the old Navy men wanted to look at this new ship coming in. And of course our captain, he was really a, wanted us to be on our toes. We got there at Pearl Harbor and they assigned us to a fast carrier forces. This is a picture of a uh, aircraft carrier. They're a marvelous ship. Uh, they're about 15 stories high. They're the length of uh, three football fields. Uh, they carried a crew of 2,400 people. In addition to that, they had the uh, 
uh, planes on there, and they had a separate crew. It was almost counting the pilots and the mechanics, and there were almost a thousand men. And uh, that was an honor to be assigned to this uh, this fleet. We were at Halsley's, called Task Force 38. Kind of lost some of my things here. One thing is, I got a card here where I crossed the uh, international date line. Then we went uh, across the equator, and that was quite of a hazing I got going across there. They shaved my head, uh, put me in a stockade and you know, on wet water, and prodded me with an electric thing. They had a big, the biggest, heaviest guy aboard ship. They had him all greased up with the stinkiest stuff you could ever imagine. I had to kiss him. And then the final. Right, you had to go through, all of us had to go through that, it hadn't crossed the equator. They sent you through a line of men and they kicked you and hit you and uh, one officer I know they didn't like very well. Uh, they really battered and <laughs> bruised him up. Then we got through that and I, be, I was called a polywog, but then since I got across the equator and got this card, I was a polywog no longer. The uh, first uh, thing we got involved in really was the uh, Palaloo Islands. They were south of uh, the equator there, and uh, we did some shore bombardment uh, there, and that's about all we did there. But while we was there, we got a, a Life magazine photographer and writer aboard our ship for about a week. And uh, he wanted to, he was writing a story about being on a destroyer in the Navy in the South Pacific. And on uh, October 23rd, 43, this, was, this picture here was a full page on Life magazine. And this is our ship here. This is just our ship here coming alongside of a aircraft carrier. I got some scenes here of uh, what we did aboard the ship. He was interested in that. This is a typical picture, swabbing the deck. Seems like they're always swabbing the deck. As an officer, did you have to do that also? Oh, no, an officer didn't do anything. Okay. I even, uh, uh, this black steward, was a, there were seven of us took care of about 20 officers. He, even, he didn't have enough to do it. He wanted to shine my shoes. And I told the fellow, I said, uh, I've shined my shoes all my life. You don't need any. He says, oh, he says, I don't have enough to do. So I set my shoes out and every morning my shoes are shining. This is the way we sent signals uh, uh, at sea. Most of it was done this way. That way there was no radio uh, messages that could be inter inter in interrupted by the, in by the enemy. Seems like at sea all the time we were doing several things. We were always getting provisions. And that's taking provisions aboard ship. We didn't have very big storerooms. Another thing was we used up a lot of ammunition, and this is uh, taking sh uh, ammunition sh uh, small shells here that uh, we got from the ammunition ship. The other thing is, we had real powerful motors on our ship, and it seems like to me we were always refueling. This is just a picture of a destroyer refueling from a uh, tanker, I believe. This is just a picture here of uh, what the chief's mess looked like. The chiefs had a separate mess hall aboard our ship. They were like sergeants in the army. They were really important people. During this time, we did a lot of uh, gunnery practice. Our captain wanted us to be accurate. Uh, here's firing a torpedo. This is my uh, machine gun. It was a quad 40. It had an automatic sight on, and uh, we shot at quite a few planes with this uh, this gun. I'll tell you later about one of these fellows, the second one in here, got hit by a piece of shrapnel.
the first battle we were in was uh, any consequence was uh, a battle of Lady Golf. This was the uh, largest naval engagement in world history. There were the Japanese uh, sent three fleets. MacArthur had landed on Lady on Lady at this time. This is about ten days, I think, after the men landed there. And the Japanese Navy they had three fleets coming down. And they were going to kick the United States Navy out of the Philippines. And uh, in this battle, I think it lasted roughly. I'm saying about ten days. There were 300 ships involved, 180,000 men. Uh, 35 destroyers were uh, hit and uh, 12 were sunk. And they estimated that uh, 13,000 men died in this naval battle and most of them were uh, Japanese. After uh, about 10 days, the Japanese fleet was uh, scuttled and the Japanese fleet was really no longer a factor in the, the war. And what year was that, Gene? What, when was that? That was in, uh, let's see, 1944. On October the 3rd, 44. 44. Okay. That's when we start. Then uh, after, about a week or two later, I went ashore at the Philippines. It's just uh, a couple pictures here. Uh, this is a village and uh, uh, the homes are, are just huts there with dirt floors. A few of them were really uh, one, uh, were, ele were electrified, and all they had was a light bulb hanging down from the middle of the ceiling. This is a picture of me right uh, here watching the Filipino uh, grinding up rice to make into rice cakes. This is uh, me here a day in the all. Uh, at sea. <clears throat> I was one of the busiest men aboard ship. At sea, I always had things to do, it seemed like. The captain, if I didn't, he assigned me other things to do to keep me busy. And then I was in port, <clears throat> all the other, <clears throat> all the other were taking liberty. I was always uh, getting supplies and uh, was very busy in port. Got a few pictures here just about liberty. That was an important thing. Our ship had a steel deck and they wore out shoes. The guys were always wearing out their shoes, and Liberty was a big deal. We only got about three or four a year or so I was in the Pacific. This here's a ship, uh, a boat coming along to take our men. They always wanted to put in a few more men than the ship was, or the boat was carry. This is a kind of a island like we got in. There was nothing there but uh, beach, and you got to walk on the sand. Uh, we had beer aboard the ship, but we couldn't drink it aboard the ship. Each man generally we took two uh, bottles of beer, cans of beer for each man. This is a picture of one of the best ones I got to go to and we just had a good time. They brought food and we played uh, you know, shooting dice and cards and uh, then we had a baseball game here between the Chiefs and uh, enlisted men and uh, Officers. How, how long would a liberty last? Well, journey is just it was just a one day deal. A one day it's deal. One day deal. Okay. There. We, and it would you would just take they would just take you to an island that yeah would happen to be yeah available. just they'd just be off the ship and okay. they'd go swimming. Of course, when we were uh, anchored, a lot of times the fellows went swimming off the ship anyhow. But some of the places we were anchored, there was shark around. You didn't want to go swimming. But they enjoyed that. Well, I want to talk a, just a little bit about the battle. I had six battle stars, and the worst one we were in was uh, off of Okinawa. This is an aircraft. Uh, yeah, that's an aircraft carrier that got hit. You got to hit journey by torpedoes. Our job as a destroyer was to protect the aircraft carriers. Uh, generally, each group had uh, four aircraft carriers in the middle of it. There's a battleship with it. 
two or three cruisers and there were about 15 to 30 destroyers and we were just had a ring around them. We had, uh, they worried mostly about uh, torpedoes from submarines. We had good anti-submarine devices aboard our ship. And the other thing was the Japanese Navy was gone by this time, but they uh, had planes, kamikaze planes and uh, also torpedo planes and our job was to put a circle of fire up that, uh, so they wouldn't get into aircraft carriers. This here was a ship, this, uh, this is an aircraft, this is one aircraft we shot down. This right here, this thing here is uh, where a bomb, this, this plane dropped this bomb, he missed it. It's about, I don't know, 150 feet from where we were. And this is a plane burning on the water. Well, this picture you can't tell anything, but I wanted to tell two things about it. Up here in this corner was a plane called Betty. We shot this plane down. It was a, a twin-engine plane, and underneath it, it carried a bomb with a man on it. They had uh, 25 of these, I think, 25 of those planes. And uh, they dropped the bomb. This guy had enough guiding system. To, to, he was on the bomb, and he tried to hit a ship. Uh, they weren't very effective because they couldn't steer very good. He went down with the bomb? Oh, yeah. He was a suicide. Oh, okay. Suicide. That was, they just thought it was... Anyhow, they had 25 of them, I guess. That's what I heard in the Okinawa Bomb. We shot one of them down. The other thing was, is this is a battleship Indiana. Uh, we were next to it, and uh, the only casualty we had aboard everything we was involved in was one man and my gun crew. He got hit with a piece of shrapnel. And we finally decided the shrapnel came from the battleship Indiana. It was shooting through our ship, and uh, some of these shells had in them a magnetic radar deal, the five inch shells that went off automatically when it came within 50 or 60 feet of something that was hot or uh, metal. And we think it, uh, that. Uh, a shell from that ship exploded and a piece of shrapnel hit one of my men right it just missed his spinal cord about a quarter of an inch and I never saw blood pop out so red in all my life is from this fellow he survived it and then uh, about five years ago I was at a blue reunion at Mobile Alabama and an officer came up to me who was about 15 feet from me when this happened he says, here's a piece of shrapnel at the time that you got, that your man got hit. It wasn't that piece, but another piece, and he kept that as a souvenir. In this battle, here's a, another Japanese plane burning on the water. There were a lot of them. This is a sister ship that uh, got hit. One station for us, another destroyer. Uh, this shows the, uh, can't really tell much, it's about the battle, but back in here is uh, USS Franklin, an aircraft carrier that was uh, caught fire from uh, two bombs that got hit. It exploded their ammunition and uh, the, uh, the captain of that ship got orders to abandon the ship. Uh, he wouldn't do it. Uh, first, uh, well, anyhow, I wanted to show you what this looked like. There were a lot of planes around. This, this thing went along for about 10 days, I'd say, the Battle of Okinawa. I went one time 52 hours without any sleep, and I thought, boy, I set a record. And I talked to two fellow officers after that, and one said he'd gone 54, and the other said he's 56. So we, we weren't sleepy, I'll tell you. So excited, and you stayed awake. Uh, this is a picture of that aircraft carrier, Franklin, and we were ordered to go alongside it to uh, see if we could help me. This is our ship right here, and I can still feel the heat from that ship. It was just uh, high aviation gas burning, fuel oil burning, and uh, there was no way that the men aboard that ship could have abandoned it because uh, the water was around there. You, you just couldn't get through it. 
and our captain wouldn't go any closer to it because he thought he put our ship in danger. But there was we couldn't have done anything when he got there anyhow, hardly. But anyhow, this is a man on that ship trying to clear on one side. It was there about a 13 degree angle. But I don't know how they ever did it. I've never seen a ship so banged up in all my life. But the captain wouldn't abandon ship, and uh, they uh, finally limped back to uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard. Took them, I don't know, about six from weeks to do it. From the Pacific? From they the went Pacific, all the way to the Brooklyn yeah, Navy Yard? Yeah, they, the ship, oh. captain took it back there. There were 724 men killed off of that ship. Here's a Japanese pilot picked up. Uh, he didn't want to die for the emperor. He wanted to live. What happened to the, when you picked them up? What I mean? Well, I've got some pictures here if I can show you. I don't know where I've got them or not. We picked up 18 pilots out of the water. I may run on to them later here. I've got my pictures kind of messed up here. We picked up 18 pilots out of the water and took them back to either a uh, their own aircraft carrier or to a, a fueling ship, but we transferred them back to somewhere. All of them were, uh, they'd been shot down or they ran out of gas or they had uh, mechanical trouble. Uh, we picked up one fellow that we thought was dead. Uh, the doctor gave him a shot of adrenaline and drained about a pint of blood out, uh, a, a pint of water out of his lungs. I told uh, my chief commissary steward, I said, uh, the doctor thinks he's not going to live. He said, be sure we got space to put him in our refrigerated storeroom until we transfer him back. But he made it two days later. Uh, we transferred him back to an aircraft carrier. Well, he was a thankful fellow. He wanted to give uh, the doc his uh, 45 automatic he carried. But uh, th those men were really grateful, but they were sure glad to get off the destroyer. Uh, all the pilots became seasick on our ship. Uh, we picked up one time, we were always doing messages, doing something special, picking up an admiral. Or we picked up uh, 23 pilots to transfer, they were relieving 23 pilots on another on an aircraft carrier. And boy, were they glad to get off our ship. They were seasick. Uh, this is a picture of uh, us at night. We bombarded uh, some. Uh, uh, in the South China Sea, we went over in China and bombed a couple of other places there. The Japs occupied China, and we just wanted to show the, the Japs, I guess, that we could bomb China. There wasn't really any good reason for it, but anyhow, we did it. Now, this time during, after the Battle of Okinawa, I visited quite a few places. I went to Saipan. I was talking to a Marine there. And uh, he gave me a, uh, this is a 50 yen bill. The Marine said he had taken it out of a dead Japanese soldier, and he said I could have it. So that's where that bill came there. Oh, he was talking about uh, rescuing pilots. There's a pilot right there, if you can see it. He was lucky, he got his raft going and he was in that and we picked him up. And here we are transferring a pilot to a, probably an aircraft carrier. Uh, my time, I'm spending a lot of time here. Uh, one thing was mines. We. Uh, uh, when we were close to Japan, there were quite a few mines out, and they, they were da very dangerous. We, uh, this is us exploding one mine. We, we exploded, I think, eight mines, and one of them got almost hit our ship. A sister ship got hit by one of these mines, it exploded our ammunition, and only 50 men out of about 240 lived from that experience. Oh, I want to keep talking about, oh, it, Tinian. Uh, after Saipan, I went to Tinian, and uh, I was there. Uh, uh, there was an airfield there, and the uh, officer told me, he says, I don't know what's going on. He says, there's something really secret. He says, I'm an Air Force officer here, and I can't even go to the base. 
she said, something going on. Well, I found out later, this is about 10 days before they dropped the atomic bomb. The atomic bomb was being assembled there on the island of Tinian. Uh, another thing, I, I had a famous guest aboard ship was John Roosevelt. He was the son of FDR, our president. Uh, he was fleet supply officer, and he came over and had dinner with me one day. I'll just mention a little bit about Tokyo Rose. Tokyo Rose. People have heard about her. She had a radio program we enjoyed. She's always playing uh, songs. Stardust, Begin to Begin, Deep Purple, telling us how don't we wish we were back home. That reminds me, I hate to take time to tell another story. We were along an aircraft here and they had the band practicing and uh, the band master called over to our captain. We were getting fuel from the aircraft carrier and he uh, says, you want to, got any songs you want to play? He says, well, I'm from Kentucky. How about playing my old Kentucky home? So they played my old Kentucky home. He says, say, I got two officers here from Indiana. How about playing back home again in Indiana? So there we were cruising along this aircraft carrier playing a song to us, two Hoosiers. Besides the, uh, to get on with things here, I want to talk about typhoons. They were our worst enemy, besides the Japanese kamikaze planes. I was in three typhoons. The first one was 12-17 off of uh, the Philippines. The reason I brought this, the Navy suppressed bad news and good news, they really played it up. But anyhow, this was uh, three destroyers were sunk in this, this typhoon and never came out to January 59. They kept it secret for five or six years. And out of this here, they saved, uh, they lost 790, uh, 790 men. That's just the article. It's in the uh, January 59 issue of Reader's Digest. In the middle of January, we were in the South China Sea, and we were had been doing some bombing on the west side of China. Uh, MacArthur was uh, invading uh, Luzon at this time on the other side of the Philippines, and uh, we got orders to. Uh, Stop my time getting up or something. No, you're fine. You, you keep going. All right. No, well, anyhow, we uh, were on the west side of the China Sea, South China Sea, and they, MacArthur had sent a message to uh, President Roosevelt saying that the naval wasn't supporters weren't supporting him enough. And we were over there on the West China Sea, and we got orders to go to the east side there to get to Luzon, and this, we run into a typhoon. This is a, this, our, our destroyer was, wasn't designed for rough season typhoons. Uh, this is a picture of uh, us taking water. The old destroyers would seem to plow through these ways, but ours was wider because we had these five inch guns on. And uh, in times like this here, the ship would go up about uh, clear out of the water, the front part of the ship. You could see a sister ship It'd come clear up and then it dropped down about 12 feet and at that time a big wave would hit you. One of these waves came over and crushed an officer between the wave and a gun and he broke his leg. But anyhow, one time this wave came over so big, uh, hit us and it uh, made the were, bolts. Were there, were there men on the, on the, I mean, what, was everybody below deck or? No, most, most in these seas here, there weren't very many out on the deck, but the, this was the first, what, what was called a first lieutenant. He had to do something to check something, the anchor chain or something was uh -huh. having trouble. And he had to go up there and a wave came over and pushed him against it. We, and he broke his leg. <clears throat> Anyhow, right after that, another big wave came over and it popped out some of the bolts that held the uh, big gun on the deck. It hit it hard enough that it, uh, deck sank about four inches and we didn't even know whether we could operate the gun then and it broke uh, a framework of the ship we used some two by sixes inside to do it uh, the hull of our ship was only five inch inch thick around the ship and but it held together anyhow we were so badly damaged that we thought we were going to get to go back to 
had to be Brooklyn or San Diego and get her ship fixed. But anyhow, they sent us to a just uh, dry uh, to a destroyer tender, and here we're going into a uh, dry dock to see what damage had been done to our ship. And where was that at? Where? This was at uh, Lady Golf. This Lady is Gulf. in Lady. We went through the went through the Philippines over to the to the east side of the uh, yeah the east side of the Philippines at night, which was dangerous because there's still Japanese around here. Anyhow, we got to this dry dock. And we had lost our. This is on. This is a submarine uh, detector dome on the bottom of our ship. And some reason it got damaged. It didn't work any good. Uh, when we're going, so the aircraft carriers like to travel pretty fast. And in rough seas, they can handle 20 knots pretty good. But for us, it was real too hard on us. Uh, our ship would uh, quiver when it'd be going that fast. Enough. So then we got in the dry dock there. And maybe you can't hardly see it here, but we lost. We had two rudders on the back. We lost one third of that rudder. But anyhow, in two weeks we were fixed up and reported back to sea duty. Well, while it was being worked on, what did the men do? I mean, not everybody. We, was... uh, they just played cards, and, okay. and but that's we didn't have anything ship? to do. We they, they had to stay aboard ship. We, we oh. weren't we were too far from land. There wasn't, oh, there wasn't anything to do except these blank islands where you could go for. And they did maybe, we might have had some, a couple of them go ashore for a little recreation, but nothing much. And then I want to show the third typhoon, which was the worst one we were in. Uh, this was in June, I think, 5th of June. Uh, this is a picture here showing uh, how rough it was. And here's another picture. Uh, the waves would go three or four feet deep over the main deck of the ship. In this typhoon, uh, we took what was called a 59 degree roll. At 59 degrees, you were almost flat on the water and we were worried whether the ship was going to come back or not. That's what happened to those in the Philippines who were lost. They got lost, they got in a trough and and tipped over. But luckily, our ship came back. But uh, in this ship, in this typhoon here, two of our sister ships lost this boat. We, each of our destroyers had a, what's called a whale boat. This is ours here. It got loose from its morning, but the only thing that happened to it was a, we had a three foot gash in it, but we got it repaired. Uh, during this typhoon, uh, the winds were 130 miles an hour, and uh, I wanted to be up topside, so I tied myself to a ladder that was right close to the mast, and uh, it lasted about maybe a half hour, and then, of all things, we went right through the eye of the typhoon, and you can't believe what an eye of a typhoon is like. It's about two miles across, and the water was just as quiet as could be, and the uh, pressure was so low, it was just a real eerie feeling. Then the typhoon had to go through again to get through the eye to the next part of it, and that I said half hour. That was the most two exciting hours I ever spent in my life. That well, lasted just two hours? Huh? Just two hours? Yeah, of this real bad part. Okay. The, the real bad part. When okay. we, did, we had dishes broken, it just did all kinds of damage. In this typhoon, the Pittsburgh lost 100 feet of its bow, broke off. Two men were killed in that, and I was talking to a man who saw in a movie on the news they gave back in the peacetime, they had a picture of the, the Pittsburgh bow on the news. We were ordered to try to uh, hook a cable around it and tow it back to Guam, but we couldn't do it. Well, uh, another thing happened on I don't take time to tell that. Time's getting away from me. This You're here, doing fine, Gene. Don't worry about it. You're doing fine. This is us in Tokyo Bay. After the atomic bomb was dropped, we had a peace sea. And this is my gun here, and this is my uh, mount. Fujiyama in the background there, you can just see that. That's a famous mountain there. On the morning of the peace treaty was signed, uh, September 2nd, 1945. This isn't a very good picture, but 3,000 planes flew over uh, Tokyo Bay, and boy, it sure made you be a proud to be American. See all those planes flying over the Japanese land. 
This is a picture of the peace treaty being signed. This is our ship back right here. Uh, I got to watch it all through uh, through my binoculars. I, got, I could see pretty good. Uh, after the peace treaty was signed, a destroyer came along and picked up the Japanese dignitaries and took them to Yokohama, I think. And right after that, we had the honor of going to Right alongside of Missouri, we picked up Lieutenant General Sutherland, who was MacArthur's uh, chief of staff. We took him on our ship to the dock at Yokohama. He hopped off, and there was a s sergeant there with a Studebaker car, and the general hopped into that and went to his base there. That was quite an honor. I don't I won't, won't take any time talking about visiting except this one thing. Two officers and I visited. This is a name card I enlarged of an accountant there. He was a Japanese accountant. They invited us into their, their home. We sat on the floor in front of a coffee table like and had some tea and uh, cookies. And uh, I thought I was eating roasted peanuts, but I uh, found out later they were soybeans. Uh, then after the peace treaty was signed, uh, we got orders to go to Pearl Harbor and then on to San Francisco. We were to go ahead of the main fleet. And this is a picture of us just on our way home from Tokyo to Pearl Harbor. We showed movies at night, had the lights on. And uh, just before we got to Pearl Harbor, everyone wants to get dressed and uh, get our picture taken, be ready for liberty. So that's us approaching Pearl Harbor after the war was over. Then here we are entering, going under the Golden Gate Bridge. This is October 5th, 1945. I spent 180,000 miles on this ship. One of the three of the worst things were first is I was on a steel deck all the time, and that you sure appreciated ground. Second thing, it was so hot when we were in the battle areas that uh, I sweat a lot, and uh, sleeping in wet sheets, you just can't sleep, it's just catnapped. And the other bad thing about being on that, I went for a little over a year and hadn't, didn't talk to a white woman or a white girl. When he got in San, San uh, Frisco Bay, Francisco Bay, I found out my brother who enlisted in the Navy in January was uh, aboard an AKA and they were just getting ready to go to Guam. And he had one more night of liberty. He spent it with me and we ate in a, a fancy restaurant. The other good thing about being in San Francisco was that uh, my relief showed up. So I got a 30-day leave and uh, came home and waited for further orders. You had to have 30 points for a naval officer to get out of the Navy. If you weren't married, you didn't have any chance of getting out of the Navy real quick. Anyhow, when I was home, I got orders to uh, go by train to Portland, Oregon. And here I am in front of uh, Swan Island Naval Barracks, and I was a transportation officer. My job was to... Uh, rent planes and uh, try to get some troop trains and uh, get get men home. That was a, a thankless job. Everyone wanted to get home, but uh, anyhow, that was my job there. While I was there, the Lincoln Mercury dealer thought it'd be good publicity for them, for the transportation officer to have a new Mercury. So I bought this Mercury. This is a fourth Mercury. It was in the state of Washington. and. Uh, uh, Oregon after the war was built. Then, believe it or not, when I was in Portland, my brother got back to Bremerton, Washington. He came down and visited me. He wanted to, he wanted to drive the Mercury. came down and visited me, and then about two weeks later, I went up and visited him in Bremerton, Washington, and here, he, here we are. And uh, this is on a ferry from Bremerton to Seattle, Washington. Well, I'll just conclude my naval career. I got discharged 
uh, I gave myself a plane ticket to get back to Chicago as I was transportation officer and I got discharged on uh, May 13th, 46. I celebrated the last getting out of the Navy by having a date with my uh, college roommate's sister. And I got a lot of stories to tell, but I've said too much. Um, that your wife that you're married to now, did you meet her during the war or was that afterwards? No, uh, my wife, uh, after the war I did a, I, I went under the GI Bill and uh, they had a program at Purdue, they were trying to keep their, they had a good uh, aviation school at Purdue and they wanted to try to keep that going and uh, they had a program where you could learn to fly at, Navy, at uh, government expense. Earl Butts, who was my good friend of mine there, uh, said to be a good agricultural economist, you need to know how to fly. He certified uh, uh, that, to be, uh, that I needed to learn to fly. So I got into there. So at the Navy expense or the government's expense, I learned to fly a Cessna plane. I didn't have any trouble with my depth perception of landing on the ground. Anyhow, I had uh, I logged 45 hours in that plane. I spent 35 hours of it by myself. One day I took off from Lafayette, came up to Elkhart, and I landed at Smithfield over here and went back. Well, while I was there at Purdue doing graduate work, I got an offer of a job to go to work for New York State Legislature. And uh, so I took that job. I had an office in the State Capitol building. While there, I met my wife, Joan, married her, and we've been married for over uh, 58 years. Well, uh, Gene, we thank you for, for your interview. We thank you for your service. Um, and um, um, your, your stories are fascinating. And um, maybe we can do another interview sometime to get the rest of your stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'm talking about the Navy. I got all kinds of stories. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you.